Welcome, dear brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is good, once again, to bring to you the word of the Lord from John chapter 5. This chapter begins a new section in the book of John. From John 5 to John 12, Jesus and the Jews, the Pharisees, are interacting with one another. They are in constant conflict with one another, and it all culminates in the cross. As we come to this passage, we need to have seeing eyes and hearing ears what the word of the Lord has for us. And so let us recognize that this is the reading of the word of the Lord, his infallible word. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 17. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, in Aramaic, called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been there, who had been an invalid for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They said to him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. Let us pray. Our great God and Father, the Lord of, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we come before you and we thank you that you have made us, that you have created us for your glory, for your pleasure. We pray that your word would sink into our hearts, into our minds, that we would have hearing ears and seeing eyes, that we might become more like you as we love you and come to understand you with greater and greater clarity. We pray that as you transform our lives that your word would go forth and that we would be instruments in your hands for the transformation of the lives of those around us. We ask these things by the mighty and powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This passage demonstrates to us the power and the work of Jesus Christ. What is he up to? Why is he up to these things? And how can we see what is happening? Jesus, Jesus' work in this passage is to heal and to forgive sins. And this work reveals the glory of God's covenant faithfulness toward those whom he has chosen. We'll, we're going to use three guiding statements 
as we go through this passage. In verses 1 through the beginning of verse 9, Jesus is Lord over sickness. The second half of verse 9 through verse 13, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And then in verses 14 through 17, we see that Jesus is Lord even over sin. So with these guiding principles, guiding statements in mind, let us dive into our passage. When I was a missionary overseas, one of my fellow missionaries had a great desire to help those who were in economic distress. And one of the things that he did was he discovered that in highlands, in grasslands, the people had used, had let their cattle graze too much, and they had eaten up all the grass in the highlands. And they had turned the grass, the highland grasslands into a wasteland. I remember seeing a picture with my missionary friend and his other local friends strung out together and in the background it was completely white. I remember thinking, oh, they're in the highlands, it must be snow behind them. Well, the missionary's wife said, I know you're probably thinking that what is behind him is snow. That is not snow, that is sand. And my friend took grass seed and he planted it in that wasteland. And the seed surprisingly germinated. The locals had given up on the land. Other agricultural experts had said, there's no need. So that grass grew out of sand is an amazing thing. But even more amazing is that God takes people who are blind, lame, and paralyzed and turns them into seeing, walking, living image bearers. And he does so because of his grace and his mercy. Now, the context of our verses Chapter 5, verse 1, tells us after this, or after these things, there was a feast of the Jews. This phrase, after this or after these things, in this particular context, is being used as a transitional uh, phrase to tell us that, hey, at the end of John chapter 4, there's a break, there's a pause, we don't know how long things uh, took place or how many things took place between the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, but chapter 5 definitely brings to bear, brings to the fore, a new section of the book of John. There was a feast of the Jews. We're not told which of the, feast, which of the feasts it was. It was probably one of the three major feasts that the Jews celebrated each year, Passover, Pentecost, or the Feast of Tabernacles, once in the spring, once in the summer, and once in the fall, the Jews would all gather together in Jerusalem for a week-long feast. God gave the people of Israel three weeks vacation every single year, and it was a beautiful thing, but the children of Israel did not always celebrate all those feasts, but which of the feasts is not terribly important. The point of the passage is that there's a great crowd. The entire nation of Israel, or as many as it could come, were in Jerusalem. So, in the midst of this great throng, this multitude, this crowd, Jesus goes to the Sheep Gate. He goes to the Pool of Bethesda, where there is a five roofed colonnade. Now, Bethesda. Bethesda means the house of God's covenantal love. 
So it is at this pool where the people of Israel were gathered as a multitude. It was expected that people would be living, breathing, seeing image bearers of God. But it is a picture of the state of Israel that there was a multitude of invalids around this pool. These people were physical representations of what it is like to be spiritually idolatrous and spiritually dead. These people were poor, they were destitute, and you will notice that, perhaps, that in the ESV, verse 4 is missing. This is an interesting note because in certain manuscripts, scribes would come along and in the margins make a note about what was going on with the passage. And later scribes, not knowing whether that marginal note should be included in the text or not, would insert it into the text. And so, originally, well, when the when the scripture was translated from Greek into English during the Renaissance and the Reformation, verse four, the manuscripts that the uh, that the reformers and that uh, Wycliffe had, they included this verse. But as we've gone and discovered older, more reliable texts, we recognize that this text. Uh, this verse should not be, it was not part of the original, but it is an interesting cultural note. John, the author of this gospel, is assuming that the people who are reading this understand what's going on with the Pool of Bethesda. And so a scribe who did know this um, was saying, hey, this information will be helpful to those who are reading who don't understand what's going on. Now, verse 4 says, whenever the, an angel would come to the pool and stir it up, the first one into the pool would be healed. And that is a good information to have, but it's probably not part of the original text. So, out of this multitude, in verse 5, one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And Jesus, knowing that he had been there a long time, came up to this one man out of the multitude, and he said, Do you want to be healed? This is an interesting question. Do you want to be healed? Because if you don't want to be healed, that is indication that you want to stay in your state of sickness, of being paralyzed, of being blind or lame, or some sort of invalid. It is an interesting fact that many people do not want to renounce their sins, to walk away from their rebellion against God. And so Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And the man's answer indirectly is, yes, I do. He says, sir, I want to, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. So this man has been there a long time. He's tried to drag himself into the pool before somebody else can get there. Who knows how many attempts he has made. But Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And when the man says, yes, I do, I can't, I can't heal myself. I can't do it on my own. Jesus says, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he walked. Jesus is Lord over sickness. This man was restored to full health 
because God was faithful, covenantly faithful with himself. And this, the third sign that Jesus has done so far in the book of John, points to Jesus being Lord over sickness. Jesus is Lord over being paralyzed. He is Lord over the state of our souls. And when he commands us to get up, take up our beds, and walk, we who gladly obey do so with great rejoicing. Now, an interesting fact is that not only is Jesus Lord over sickness, he is also Lord over the Sabbath. And as we turn to the rest of our passage, we see that the beginning of the conflict between Jesus and the Jews happens over this Sabbath question. Verse 9b, Now that day was the Sabbath, and the Jews find this man who is carrying his bed. Now, in order to understand their reaction, we need to go back in time a little bit, uh, perhaps a few hundred years, and see why it was so important to the Jews that no one carry anything on the Sabbath. In the time of Nehemiah, when the children of Israel were, when the remnant was brought back from Babylon, and the temple had been built, and the walls had been restored, Nehemiah set up a new, a renewal of the covenant. There was a renewal of a commitment to keeping the law of God. Now, what Nehemiah did was, was a good thing. It is good in God's strength to keep his covenantal requirements. But what Nehemiah did, one of the things that he did was he said to those merchants who were coming in on the Sabbath and carrying their burdens in order to sell their wares and make a profit, what he told those people was, hey, I'm shutting the gates of Jerusalem, and I'm not letting you in, and if you keep coming to knock on the gates, I'm going to kill you. Breaking the Sabbath was a capital punishment. It was a crime that deserved capital punishment. Back in Numbers, a man was stoned just for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. So with this kind of background in mind, as well as the understanding that the Jews, in order, because they were so scared and not wanting to be sent into exile again, they set up lots of rules and regulations for how to keep the law so that they wouldn't uh, fall into idolatry again. And because of these things, because of these added regulations, they thought that the man who was carrying his mat on the Sabbath was violating the Sabbath. And so they interact with this man who has been healed, and they, they tell him, you cannot carry your mat. You cannot carry your bed. It's a, it's a burden. It's a violation of the Sabbath. Well, <laughs> the man says, well, I, the man who healed me, he, he told me to take up my bed and walk. And so the Jews turn their ire from the man to the one who had healed him, because they recognized that the one who had done the healing had greater power and greater authority than the man who was carrying his bed. And so they asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know, and Jesus, after healing this man, apparently had disappeared into the crowd. And as he disappeared, the man says, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to tell you who has healed me yet. But 
Jesus is demonstrating that he is Lord over sickness and he is Lord over the Sabbath. And as Jesus finds this man again, he is not only Lord of sickness and over the Sabbath, but he is also Lord over sin. Verses 14 and following. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. So, apparently the man had taken his bed back to his home. He had come back to the temple and had sought to worship the one true God. He had sought to enter in for the first time in at least 38 years to worship together with his people, the one true God. And the one true God finds him in the temple crowd. <laughs> he says, see, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Now, we know from Job, and we know from later in the book of John, that not every sickness, not every malady, is a, a direct result of our sin. However, sin does have consequences, and we need to recognize that sinning no more doesn't mean that we won't occasionally stumble and fall, but it does mean, drawing from the verb tense for sin in the simple present, it's the same verb tense that is used in the book of 1 John to indicate a continual habit of sinning. So if you don't have that continual habit of sinning, then that is what Jesus is talking about. And that is what will help this man keep from having anything worse that will happen to him. So the man takes this good news, I have been healed, I have been forgiven of my sins, I have been commanded to go and sin no more, and because I have received these benefits, I've got to tell other people, and he goes and tells the Jews. The man went and told the Jews, verse 15, that it was Jesus who had healed him. Jesus had healed him. But instead of rejoicing in the work of God and recognizing that the one who had been promised to take away the sins and the penalties and the consequences of sin, instead of rejoicing in that, the Jews go after Jesus and they start persecuting him. We're told in verse 16, because these things were done on the Sabbath. And so the conflict was between Jesus and the Jews. Who has the authority to define what is right and wrong to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus concludes our passage with, My Father is working until now, and I am working. He is equating himself with the Father. He is saying, I am God, I am working together with the Father. I and the Father are one. And in the face of this statement, we will see next week and following, the Jews want to kill Jesus. But it is because Christ has done the work that we can have a Sabbath rest. Because Christ has done the work of obeying the Father, of loving the Father with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and his neighbor as himself. He did both perfectly. He kept the law. He did not command this man who had been healed to break the law. The man was not carrying his burden in order to make a profit. He was carrying the burden that is light, the yoke that is easy. Christ's work on our behalf 
means that we can stop our own works of self-righteousness. We can stop behaving as though we are in control. We can rest in God's completed work on the cross of the forgiveness of sins that we who turn and trust, who repent and believe can know that our sins have been placed once for all on Christ and that his righteousness once for all has been placed on us. And because of that, we can with joy gather together with his people in the house of God, rejoicing in and celebrating the covenant faithfulness of God. We are in the house of God's covenant faithfulness. And that is something worth celebrating, worth rejoicing in, and worth proclaiming in this life and for all of eternity. Let us rejoice together, rest together, and worship together. For Jesus is Lord over sickness, is Lord over the Sabbath, and he is Lord over sin. Father, we come before you and we are grateful for what you have accomplished. We thank you for sending us your Son to take our sins upon himself, to die the death that we deserve, to be raised again so that we can be united with him in his life and resurrection. We pray that you would turn our hearts from sin to glad, rejoicing obedience. We pray that you would cover us with your Son's righteousness, and we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to give us the life and the breath that we need in order to make you known and to praise you for all of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.